Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is a really good crowd. We were, we were seeing that the numbers were going to be a couple hundred, and we're, we're glad that people are actually here. Uh, so first of all, thank everyone for showing up. Uh, we're very excited to be here. Uh, we were in, in, you know, in preparations for this, uh, for this presentation, for this uh, speech, we were talking about a couple days ago, we were talking about what we really like about conferences and what we like about uh, you know, general tech conferences. And one of the things we really like was that you know, when you make a submission to, to, uh, to do a presentation like this, you, if you get accepted, one of the great things is that you know, it's, a, it's a justification, especially in a big company like IBM, it's a justification to come to a conference, to, to travel, to, to visit, to, to meet with people. And, uh, but the, the interesting thing about uh, OpenStack Summit is that it's a little bit different. You know, it's a lot like normal tech conferences in that there's uh, an opportunity to talk with partners, with customers, with uh, see what the competition is doing. But OpenStack is really unique in that here, the, the sessions, the technical sessions, are really give you a good variety of, of information. They give you lots of, uh, lots of details, lots of technical details if you're interested, or lots of high level architecture uh, overviews and discussions. And beyond that, you actually get to talk to the developers. And so we're, uh, we're really excited about that. We like the opportunity to talk, uh, to see the design sessions, to, to see all that. And so we're, we're very happy to be here, and we were very pleased to be accepted here with our, uh, with our presentation. Uh, what we, so what we decided to do is when we were planning the proposal is think about what we liked best in these, in these sessions. Uh, we've, been to, we've been coming to these sessions for, for a couple now, uh, and what, really what we liked are the sessions that are the combination of technical and uh, that give you details on how you do things, but also give you an overview of, of what you did and, what, uh, and what's going on with the topologies, with the, the thinking behind things are. And so that's what we wanted to do, that's what we proposed, and we're really happy it got accepted. Uh, so today's presentation is titled, A Practical Approach to Deploying a Highly Available and Optimally, and optimally Performing OpenStack. And really, the objective is, the reason we're doing this is that at the heart of, the, uh, of, of everything that we've been doing in high availability is we've been taking all this information from the community uh, on how to configure your high available, highly available systems and how you uh, uh, set up uh, uh, your policies. And basically, we wanted to give back because there's a couple, uh, there's, um, there's some areas where there's some gaps between the documentation uh, uh, available officially and the documentation that, that, that uh, individuals have. So we just wanted to, you know, at IBM, we find it really important to give back. And this is one way for us to give back from the, the practical approach to high availability. Uh oh. It's obviously not running an open stack, so that's the situation we have right now. Uh. Oh. Okay. Nope. All right. Let's just go this way. All right, guys, you're going to have to excuse us. We're going to have to do it this way, I guess. That's fine. All right, we'll just do this this way. Pull the clicker. Okay, sorry about that. So the, the first thing we'll start with is 
we'll talk about, uh, Jeffrey will talk about our active, passive HA environment that they set up in China. Uh, after that, he'll show us a quick demo. Uh, then we'll talk about, Sean and I will talk about the uh, active, active environment that we set up in the soft layer environment. Uh, then finally, we'll have Tony talk to us about uh, HA orchestration with Heat and Chef. Uh, after that, hopefully I didn't spend all our question time right now. Uh, you guys will be able to ask us a couple questions. And like I said, we're really here to, we want to give back. So if you guys have, have any more questions after the mics have been shut off, we'll be outside and we'll gladly answer any questions. Okay? So let me hand off the, this time to Jeffrey to talk about Active Passive. All right. Thanks, Meryl. Okay. Um, I'm going to take uh, about uh, 10 minutes uh, and, uh, to give you a, a very uh, brief uh, um, demo and we captured from uh, one of uh, our um, key customers uh, in, in China and, and in, in the production and we have uh, the high availability uh, of uh, the database. Um, so our goal is uh, very simple. Um, we use uh, MySQL and a database and we want to keep the database uh, uh, high availability and uh, make sure the data in the database uh, and uh, persistent. And if uh, we, uh, we lose uh, and, uh, one of uh, um, the database uh, in the pair and we still want to keep uh, the data. And also the, the IP address uh, and we uh, maintain it and uh, when the database uh, daemon and uh, fail over and uh, when the failure detected. Um, so this is a production and environment and, and we, uh, we just captured and, uh, one week ago and before we came here. Okay, first of all, and give a very, very and a high level and architecture. So under, underneath, and this is a, and a one physical box, this is another one underneath, and we have a DRBD, a distributed a replicated block device, and which is in mirror mode. And DRBD maintains DRBD maintains uh, on the data and the synchronization automatically. Um, the daemon works uh, on the raw disk. So on top of that, we have uh, uh, active, uh, passive, uh, standby uh, MySQL database and installed uh, on each of uh, and the nodes. And on top of that, we have uh, CoralSync and the two maintain the heartbeat and send the signal to make sure and another pair and it works and they know each other. And pacemaker is um, a um, process um, trigger and whenever on the coral sync figures that there is a, a, um, a failure, it will trigger on a pacemaker to take the action and for the recovery. And the recovery uh, contains and the IP uh, floating and uh, the MySQL uh, daemon on the recovery. Um, we have uh, uh, the two fuser boxes, uh, as I said earlier. And can I pop that, please? Okay. And this is uh, uh, the, the uh, host 10, and you can see the host name here. This is a host 20, and this, this uh, in, in one box, uh, this is a host 20. And I open um, uh, the pacemaker monitoring and on the fly and to monitor um, the pacemakers and the coral sync. And so we can see the master is um, on the, uh, host 20 and the slave is a host 10. So we have uh, the file system of uh, MySQL, uh, which is uh, uh, offered by, by DRBD, and uh, the IP address and uh, the MySQL daemon. 
And uh, so we can, from here, we can see the MySQL daemon and is running on host 20. And we check uh, the DRBD and the status, so we can see the primary and uh, the secondary, secondary, and so they know each other. And this part, host 20, is uh, the primary, and this part, host 10, is the secondary. So we can see, and they know, they, uh, they talk to each other. And also we see the IP address assigned to uh, MySQL daemon, 1010203.19. Uh, and we check uh, the IP address here, and it does not show up. So, and, and after, and we uh, make uh, an emulated uh, failure, and the IP address and uh, will be uh, floated and uh, from host 20 to host 10. So, I ran the, um, um, the, the, the chorusing command and uh, to and, uh, make a host 20 standby. So, you can see the status changed and um, it switches and um, uh, the file system of uh, MySQL over DRBD from uh, and host 20 to host 10. So you can see and um, everything and uh, changed. And uh, host 20 is uh, in standby mode. And we check MySQL daemon uh, status. So you can see it's stopped and it, on host 10 it is running. Also, we look at the DRBD and the status, and so right now it's just in crashed mode, in standby mode, and it is, uh, it is um, uh, unknown. And so this one take uh, the primary situation. Then we make uh, the uh, backup online, and oh, before we uh, uh, make everything backup, and we, um, take a look at the IP address. So before, the IP address of MySQL daemon is on host 20, and after we make the failure, and we can see the IP address and a switch and from host 20 to host 10 automatically. So it's gone. And 20319 works on host 10. So right now we um, we make a host 10 in standby mode and to force all the daemons and coming back from 10 to 20. So that is pretty much and what I want to talk. All right, I give it back to Anna Manuel. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So let's talk now about uh, active active high availability. <clears throat> Our goal really was we, you know, as we were working with environments and developing new environments, we wanted to improve the stability, the reliability, and the scalability over the previous environments that we've been building. Uh, and then we wanted to build a platform that was uh, reliable and strong enough to deploy, to, to deploy uh, Cloud Foundry workloads. Uh, if you saw yesterday our colleagues uh, discuss the Cloud Foundry uh, deployment on top of, of OpenStack. So that was, that was part two to, the, to this presentation. Um, and so Cloud Foundry uh, workloads have very unique characteristics. Uh, the big one, the one that we found that really stresses the, the environments the most, the OpenStack the most, is that when it deploys initially, it deploys about 30, 40 VMs uh, at once, and with the previous environments that we had, it was actually stressing OpenStack, and we were having some, uh, some issues that we'll detail a little bit later, and so that's one thing you have to consider. You also have to consider that Cloud Foundry uses uh, volumes a lot, stores a lot of information on Cinder, so we have to be careful of that. Uh, there's a lot of network I.O., it's very chatty in between, and so you have to worry about uh, the reliability of your network. Uh, and then also, there's a lot of API. It's a very uh, heavy API, OpenStack API user. So you have to consider that as well. And so we had a couple decisions to make with uh, regards to our architecture. The first one was, do we want to scale up, give it more hardware, or do we want to scale out? And what we ended up doing is that we decided on scale out. Uh, the combination of Cloud Foundry and OpenStack makes it very easy 
to, to uh, be, they're very complementary in the fact that you can add hardware, add resources, and they both utilize it very well. Uh, and this, this gives you the ability to match the requirements that the workloads have. Uh, and then the second big decision that we uh, had to make was between uh, active-passive or active-active. And you know, with our experiences uh, last year, especially with, uh, with the previous releases, we really decided that active-active was a requirement. This is something that we needed to do. So the, the big advantages are obviously uh, availability, but also the fact that your, uh, the utilization is distributed between all your, all your servers. Uh, and obviously, since uh, the utilization on the whole uh, uh, per server goes down, the response times get better, and obviously your, uh, your failover time is improved. Uh, so now, uh, here's an architectural overview. Now, if you've, if you've seen, if you're familiar with high availability, this is the general architecture that OpenStack community has, uh, has pretty much defined, right? That we've agreed upon the, the cloud controllers, the, the, the two cloud controllers, the, the data nodes, uh, the storage nodes, everything, the, the high availability model, this is it. The only thing that we've really uh, modified is we added a little bit, uh, some more load balancers, and then some, uh, and we'll get into the details, uh, but the point was that this is, we basically took the community uh, uh, recommendations, uh, and then we've found some tweaks and some gaps, and we've, uh, we've modified them a little bit. So now Sean's gonna walk, walk us through the rest of the architecture. Okay, so when we're trying to build out a uh, highly available and scalable OpenStack deployment, we, we need to ensure a couple of things. One, that we have a stable and uh, fast responding message queue, because as you all know, all the services talk over the bus. So one of the things we looked at was comparing or looking at different uh, queue systems like Cupid, but we ended up going with RabbitMQ in this case. Uh, RabbitMQ uh, is, very simple to set up, it's clustering. You simply go through these, these few steps here. You basically pass cookie around to enable the trust between the nodes, uh, and then you basically tell the nodes to join the cluster. So as you see here in the picture, we have uh, three data nodes. Um, they're all running RabbitMQ, um, and we'll show you there it also runs our database as well. But once those queues are set up and put into the cluster, uh, we define the HA policy to make sure the replication across those data nodes sync up all of uh, its messages. RabbitMQ also comes with a pretty good monitoring application that you can enable, which helps really debug if, you, you know, if you're having some issues or you see some performance issues inside of your OpenStack environment. It really helps you kind of narrow down to figure out, well, is it really backing up or queuing up all of these uh, requests? or you know, maybe is it a database problem or somewhere else um, within that environment. Uh, the second bit or point uh, service that's running on this is MySQL. And for an active, app, active replication model, we're using Galera to synchronize all the data across the persistent uh, information. Uh, we found it fairly straightforward to implement Galera. Uh, out of the box, it works. However, we, there was a, a note that we found online that you know, says, you know, there is that contention where you will run into some deadlocks. And we actually ran into this a couple of times. And so what happens is, uh, typically when, you, when you're writing to one database, you could have multiple services or endpoints updating that same row where it would cause this deadlock issue. So um, the good thing about OpenStack is if it does catch this error, it'll retry and um, reattempt uh, that update. However, you do see a lot of warnings inside the error logs or uh, your, your uh, service logs, and that's something that we want to get rid of. So uh, we decided to kind of implement more of an active standby config, which is shown in the next chart. Uh, but some additional things that we wanted to do with MySQL, because we're you know, trying to scale up and ensure performance performance metrics support our Cloud Foundry deployment, that we have to do some tweaking as well in the database. So 
we looked at you know, tweaking max our connection sizes, our thread pools, um, and buffer sizes, et cetera. So one of the fundamental things for getting to an HA config in OpenStack is you, know, you need to ensure that you have some way of load balancing all of these requests that are coming in. Um, and we do this uh, using HA proxy uh, for a load balancer. Uh, any load balancer typically will do. This is one of the uh, recommended configurations that are supported in the OpenStack uh, HA guide. So we decided to try that out. Um, we found it to be fairly useful. It does provide some types of stats functionality where it can report a number of connections that are active and things like that, which you know, provides a great way to help also look into tuning your system as well. We also found that uh, in the configuration for HA proxy that your session timeouts do matter, depending on what type of service are connecting to it. Um, for data nodes, like uh, your connection is back to your queue and your database, that these time session timeout values have to be a lot longer because uh, all the services typically want to persist connections back to the database. Uh, so that's something we have to tweak. And, but for most of the other services, uh, like Nova API, Keystone, et cetera, most of the default values work fine. Uh, so in conjunction with HA proxy, we're using uh, Keep Alive to manage the virtual IP or the VIP. Uh, this basically helps redirect in case one of those uh, load balancers go down uh, to migrate that IP over to the secondary load balancer. Uh, just a quick note, we, we use three pairs of uh, HA proxy configurations. Uh, this could all well just be put into one a uh, load balancer, but we wanted to have a easier way to kind of help debug and look into, you know, whether if it was, if there were some issues within our data nodes or our storage nodes or uh, compute. So this is just a high level kind of picture of how we have our data nodes set up. Uh, as I said, we have three of them all running MySQL Rabbit with active active replication across all the nodes, uh, fronted by a pair of HA proxy uh, load balancers. So going back to that uh, previous point about the write lock contention, um, there's two kind of two configurations that we saw fit for this. So the first one is a targeting a single primary. So what we mean by an active passive config, we're doing really active passive load at the load balancer level, not at the database level. So in the back, there's, all, there's still active active replication, but we're all targeting one primary node uh, to write with, and then the replication of that data gets pushed across. Uh, so the way we do this is, as you can see here, a little snippet for the HA proxy config. We're all targeting the first MySQL node, and then if that dies, then uh, failovers push to the secondary node and, and, and so on. But with the previous approach, uh, we don't get full utilization of all our servers. So uh, one method we, we found was being able to configure the load balancers with different ports. So we could configure ports to particular services. So for example, on the first node, we could have uh, all of our Nova uh, requests go to a single node, uh, followed by maybe Keystone requests going to a secondary, and maybe all of the services that are not as chatty going to a third node. Um, this provides us a way to kind of load balance uh, all of those uh, requests, but still have that replication across in the back. For, for the OpenStack services, so now that you have a, you know, a pretty solid backend foundation for all your messaging and persistent data, now you can really get started with your OpenStack services. The one thing you need to do here is once you have those uh, virtual IPs set up for your load balancers, that you need to register those as your target endpoints. Um, so what we see here is a picture of uh, our services registered in Keystone with the virtual IPs that are sitting on those load balancers. And this is critical because if you, you all know, if you register the services up front with, with a particular node, then you have to go in and reconfigure it, because all of the services that make requests and do token exchanges rely on what's kind of stored inside of the service registry in Keystone. 
For controller nodes, we have Horizon, Nova API, and uh, Keystone running. Um, same configuration on both nodes. So some of the things you need to do w configuring these, these nodes is, one, set up your MySQL connections to point to the particular node and port that you want to write to. Second, you need to ensure that you enable HA uh, for your queue services. So here we have in our, in our config in, for example, noble.conf, we will have rabbit hosts with the three backend nodes. Notice we're not targeting the, the VIP here. We're targeting each node. Uh, there's code in Oslo that basically provides the mechanism for failover in case one of those nodes die. It will, it will migrate to the, it will target request to the next node. And finally, enable the HAQs. The last part of the configuration is setting up the HA proxy configs. So here, we're using a round robin load balancing uh, with uh, standard timeout values, and we configure the load balancers to point to our two physical IPs on the nodes. For storage nodes, we have Cinder and Glance, uh, backed all by running uh, local storage with an Array 10 configuration. But the configuration for an HA config is pretty much the same as the other services. Here we set up the SQL config, uh, IP and port. We set up the HA replication. And then finally, the HA proxy config. Um, here we decided to use a little band scene uh, algorithm of source, basically setting all the source requests to uh, the same node. One thing we did find uh, trying to run everything in active-active configuration was the problem with the scheduler, so both Nova and Cinder. So when we were testing this out, um, and with Cloud Foundry being sort of the workload on top, as Manuel mentioned, there's a lot of requests that get pushed off at once. And so when the schedulers pick up these requests, what happens is the scheduler will both pick up a request to deploy a VM, um, on all of our compute nodes. And since they all kind of have the same perception of the, you know, the lay of the land, they will all end up targeting the same host. So what we ended up seeing is a backlog of all these requests targeted on one particular compute node, which ended up slowing down a lot of the provisioning times because that particular host ended up getting backed up to actually get all these VMs provisioned. So a uh, workaround here is to actually configure these schedulers in an active passive configuration, uh, similar to what Jeffrey was mentioning before, leveraging Pacemaker. Um, but with this config, what we do is disable Stoneith to ensure that it doesn't kill off all of those services and that we want to ignore Quorum since there's only two, a pair of these, these nodes. Uh, and then we also want to enable uh, stickiness to re prevent you know, resource failback. So in case one dies and it gets redirected, we, don't, we want to ensure that it just keeps going to that one node because there's no, there's no problem. Uh, continue down that path. And then finally for networking, um, you know, we all kind of heard some of these challenges with Neutron. And so we were, in, for this particular deployment, we were running uh, Grizzly. So um, what made sense to us was to leverage uh, Nova Networking to use a multi-host configuration, which basically allows um, uh, no single point of failure type of configuration where in case one node dies, it doesn't really affect any of these, any of the other nodes that are, could be hosting critical applications. Uh, with Neutron in Grizzly, there is no real act active, active configuration for the L3 agents, uh, which basically hosts your virtual gateway routers. So uh, to enable uh, HA for uh, Nova networking, Basically, it's setting up this multi-host property in Nova.conf, and then we set a few more parameters to enable our, for example, um, and each of these nodes are end up running a Nova network agent on them, a network network service, along with the API metadata service and compute. So to summarize the our HA experience, our active active HA experience. Some of the lessons learned here, as we mentioned, Nova and Cinder scheduler you know, can cause some issues. Um, so we kind of move to an active passive config. Our MySQL Galera, you, you, know, you do 
there are, there are chances where you will run, run into write locks, so we can segregate or split them up to load balance across multiple nodes and still have active, active replication in the back. Uh, an additional thing we found was out of the box configurations, when you're starting off, they typically don't have all the, all the config settings that you do need for high availability. So you end up having to go back to looking in, in the OpenStack wiki to see, okay, what parameters are missing and then try to fill it in. Um, but that's, that's something we hope that could be improved in the future. Uh, and in the Grizzly release, there was one slight issue with the rabbit host config for load balancing. If you noticed, um, typically what would happen is all of the requests would end up going to one primary rabbit config. Uh, this, this has been recently fixed where it would actually spread all the, all the requests throughout the, the nodes that you have defined in that, that pool. So now I'll hand it over to Tony to talk about HA orchestration with Heath and Jeff. Thank you, Sean. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we actually um, deploy our, our cloud. Um, hopefully it could be, could be some sort of inspiration to you guys. Um, so we have been talking about configurations, configurations, and configurations. And uh, so I think uh, basically all of us agree that we need an installer. Um, we, we had one, of course, um, but the issues we have been found um, is that um, the installer is usually designed from a uh, development or test perspective. Um, and uh, when we are dealing with real production level environment, um, it's usually not enough. Um, it doesn't configure the uh, network topologies out of the box. It cannot handle high availability issues. Um, so we have been investigating stuff. We have been investigating heat. We have been um, trying Chef. So with Chef, uh, it basically manipulates a single node. Um, you have all the cookbooks, you have some roles, you have some attributes in the environment. Um, and heat is, is to um, manage the whole deployment. And it's, it's really cool stuff that you can actually um, abstract the whole environment with, with some templates. And with this stuff, um, we came up with what we call deployment service. So with this deployment service, um, if, you, if you're gonna deploy in, in cloud, uh, you're gonna need two phases, uh, the, the under cloud and the over cloud. Um, we sort of uh, borrowed the uh, concepts from, from the triple O. Um, the, the under cloud is, uh, is really an all-in-one OpenStack deployment, uh, which we use to um, spawn the over cloud. And the over cloud is, um, is actually, is, is the actual service to, to our customers. Uh, of course, we, we're gonna um, describe the over cloud with, uh, with, chef, uh, with the heat templates. Uh, for example, if you just want a very simple um, all-in-one OpenStack cloud, you can just write a very simple template However, if you're gonna, if you're a big enterprise, you're you're need you, you need some sort of high availability capabilities. You can write it a you know relatively complex one. Um, so it has a lot of possibilities. Um, I'm gonna explain a little bit how how the deployment service works. Um, so basically, we're um, we have this templates. Uh, actually, I'm gonna uh, walk you through this process with the, with with this uh, with this example. Uh, this is what we actually ship with our product. So here we have um, in the resources part we have two nodes: uh, the the control node and the standby node. Um, 
you may want to pay attention to, to the metadata part where uh, we can find this uh, chef run list, the roles um, and stuff. Also this one. Um, you, you're gonna have, uh, you know, all these, uh, all these recipes uh, consolidated in the role. Uh, for example, you, you have probably Nova API here. Also, since it is highly available, you're gonna also have a, another Nova API like in here. Um, you know, uh, you can you can configure your roles. And uh, what the deployment service does is that it will, oh, it will actually pick the um, values from here, and it will um, it will actually um, apply these run list into into the the resources. So with Chef, it's uh, actually all about cookbooks, roles, and um, and environment. We have already um, you can you can actually download all these cookbooks from from the StackForge. And uh, since you're you also have the roles, uh, what we're going to need is uh, is some some um, attributes in the environment. Um, say um, since since uh, we have. You, you, you can't just hard code all these values for, for all the customers. Um, we actually uh, ship our, our environments with uh, some, of the, some of the placeholders, like, like in here, uh, it says if you're, uh, how, how, you, how, how you're going to configure the log, logging level, uh, is it debug or not, and here the network manager type. Um, So the, the end users is going to provide these actual values from, from the uh, parameters part. We have uh, some sort of uh, default values here, but of course you can override those values uh, when you uh, trigger those commands from the, uh, from the command line. Um, and the output part, we can actually see uh, th those values. Those are the exact um, placeholders we we saw previously in the in the uh, in the environment. Um, those uh, the deployment service will will actually pick those values from um, from the parameters we have configured, and it will uh, replace all the placeholders with the actual values. And it's going to, of course, do the actual deployment. So uh, with the, these stuff, with the uh, chef and heat stuff, uh, we can simplify the uh, cloud deployment while still keeping uh, enough flexibilities. So uh, great. Thank you. All right, guys, uh, we have four or five minutes. If you guys have any questions, uh, the microphones are there. All right, and if not, you can catch us up. Uh, you can follow us on, on Twitter. Here's some of our accounts. Uh, there's some more technical sessions tomorrow for, uh, as you can see up here. And uh, that's it. So thank you very much, and uh, we'll be around. <laughs>